Thanks for being here. We're going to actually start off this session with a quick video for the tech sector so you can get a little better feel for that. It's going to be about four or five minutes. I was 13 when I first got access to a, a computer. My parents bought me a, uh, a Macintosh in 1984 when I was eight years old. I was in sixth grade. I learned to code in college. Freshman year, first semester, um, intro to computer science. I wrote a program to play tic-tac-toe. I think it was pretty humble beginnings. I think the first program I wrote asked uh, things like, what's your favorite color? Or how old are you? I first learned how to make a green circle and a red square appear on the screen. The first time I actually had something come up and say, hello world, and it, the, I made a computer do that, it was just astonishing. Learning how to program didn't start off as wanting to learn all of computer science or, um, or trying to master this discipline or anything like that. It just started off because I wanted to do this one simple thing. I wanted to make something that was fun for myself and, and my sisters. And I wrote this little program, and then basically just add a little bit to it. And then when I needed to learn something new, I looked it up, either in a book or on the internet, and then added a little bit to it. It's really not unlike kind of playing an instrument or something, or, 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 you know, or playing a sport. It starts out being very intimidating, but you kind of get the hang of it over time. Coding is something that can be learned, and um, I know it can be intimidating. A lot of things are intimidating, but, uh, you know, what isn't? A lot of the coding that people do is actually fairly simple. Um, it's, it's more about the process of breaking down problems than, uh, you know, sort of coming up with complicated algorithms as people traditionally think about it. You don't have to be a genius to know how to code. You need to be determined. The Addition, subtraction, uh, that, that's about it. You should probably know your multiplication tables. <laughs> you don't have to be a genius to code. Do you have to be a genius to read? Even if you want to become a race car driver or play baseball um, or, uh, you know, build a house, all of these things have been turned upside down by software. What it is is, you know, computers are, are everywhere. You want to work in agriculture? <laughs> Do you want to work in entertainment? Do you want to work in manufacturing? You know, it's, it's just all over. Here we are, 2013. We all depend on technology to communicate, to bank, information, and none of us know how to read and write code. When I was in school, I was in this after-school group called the Whiz Kids. And when people found out, they laughed at me and, you know, all these things. And I'm like, man, I don't care. I think it's cool. And, you know, I'm learning a lot. And some of my friends have jobs. Our policy is literally to hire as many talented engineers as we can find. The whole limit in the system is just that there just aren't enough people who are trained and have these skills today. To get the very best people, we try to make the office as awesome as possible. We have a fantastic chef. Free food. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Free laundry. Snacks. Even places to play and video games and scooters. There's all these kind of interesting things uh, around the office and places where people can play or relax um, or go to think or play music or be creative. Whether you're trying to make a lot of money or whether you just want to change the world, computer programming is an incredibly empowering skill to learn. I think if someone had told me that software is really about humanity, that it's really about helping people by using computer technology, it would have changed my outlook a lot earlier. To be able to actually come up with an idea and then see it in your hands and then be able to press a button and have it be in millions of people's hands, uh, I mean, I think we're the first generation in the world that's really ever had that kind of experience. Just to think that I mean, you can start something in you know, your college dorm room and you can have a set of people who haven't built a big company before come together and 
built something that a billion people use as part of their, their daily lives is, is just crazy to think about, right? It's really, it's humbling and it's amazing. The programmers of tomorrow are the wizards of the future. You know, you're gonna look like you have magic powers compared to everybody else. I think it's amazing. It's, I think it's the closest thing we have to a superpower. Great coders are today's rock stars. That's it. Okay, so my name is Jacob Knudsen. I'm the IT Cluster Coordinator with the Department of Economic Development. And through the Department of Economic Development, we've formed an IT Council of high-level tech folks across the state. And three of those members are here with us today. We have Greg Nichols from Proxybid. It's a company in Omaha. Amanda Adams from Expansion, which is here in Kearney. And Sue Thaden from Client Resources Incorporated, which is in Omaha. So guys, I'm going to take it away. I'll start. Thanks, Jacob, and thanks for having us join you guys today. I was looking forward to it. I have about six teachers in my family from across Nebraska. First grade through my husband taught high school for 28 years in Nebraska at three different schools. So it was interesting to come to this event that he's been to so many times. But thanks for thank you for allowing us to join you guys. I'll just tee this up a little bit, and then we're going to walk through it. The thought on why we're here today is what we wanted to do is I run a computer company. I started it in 1999. And if you look at the, we have 200 employees that are mainly technical. If you look at the jobs we're hiring today, 50% of those roles didn't exist when we started our company. We're trying to keep up with the change in the career fields that exist in IT. We can only imagine as educators how hard it is to keep up with it. So our goal is really just to shed some light and awareness to you guys from the business side, what roles really exist. Hopefully it breaks a few myths, starts to get some thoughts going. We know that the key, um, if, if you look at the IT workforce, I just ended a chairman's year for an association based in Washington, D.C., and they actually uh, gather all the statistics for IT workforce in the United States and then down to the community level. And they will tell you, in the USA Today, if you ever see a report on IT labor, it's actually coming from that association. They actually gather and aggregate that data. And so at any rate, if you look at any community in the United States and you look at their unemployment, so Nebraska's four dot whatever, they say half that number is your IT unemployment. So there might be people that don't have jobs, but for the most part, there's over 1,500 open IT jobs in the state of Nebraska right now. We're graduating less than 200 a year out of our colleges and metro community colleges and schools. The shortage won't change in our lifetime. And part of what we believe is the awareness of what those roles look like. Uh, there's a lot of neat opportunities that didn't exist before. So if you look at that, one more statistic, then we'll kind of start diving into it. The annual, the average first year income of an undergrad with a computer science degree is fifty six to sixty thousand dollars they usually have five or six job offers they really get to pick what they do it's not about money it's not about all that but if it's a field they're interested in how rewarding for our state that you've got great paying jobs so if you look at it um, what we wanted to do is just walk through a few examples if everybody has bought a book on amazon.com I imagine in the room here so this is a great example of how IT is actually at the front seat in businesses if, if, if at the corporate environment the CEO runs the company, the COO helps run the company. Those are critical roles that come out of business in different areas. The CIO, Chief Information Officer, is at that top suite. It's an IT role. Then now there's also a Chief Security Officer, totally different skill set. And there's a Chief Analytics Officer, totally different skill set. So this is how important it is in our, in our economic development in the country from a business perspective that three key roles in every organization are now from an IT career path. And it's just pretty exciting to see the opportunities. So if you look at the Amazon experience, everybody's bought a book, the one-click thing. You know, you used to go and you'd get online, you'd find a book, you'd, you'd order it, you'd put in your credit card information, you'd put in your shipping information, you'd pick this, pick that. Ten days later, you get the little cardboard box in your, in your mailbox and you get to read your book. Well, Amazon was losing deals. People were finding their book and driving to the bookstore and getting it. They might want it for the weekend. They might want it for a flight. They might want it for whatever. So how it transferred from that experience to the one click was predominantly technology people at the front stage of that. And I'll walk through it in a few of my first key points to ex explain it to you. So this example we have, Farm Credit is a employer in Nebraska. They use this example to share with the rest of their company what technology does for the company. So we're just using their example to kind of just have a framework to talk about. There's nine of these rings, or eight, eight of these rings, and basically mentally, think of it as each one represents an entirely different career field within IT. So this first one, if you go with that Amazon experience, 
This first category of skills is this whole ideations category. So Amazon says, geez, we got a problem. We're not selling books. They're driving to the store and buying them. How do we make it easier? So literally creative people are kind of whiteboarding out how, what is our current process? How do we shrink it? How do we sell more books? How do we get this done easier? It's a thinking that goes on. It's a process thinking that goes on. It's idea generation. It's a totally different skill set, and it's a really exciting path. This is typically that real creative off the wall kid that you think should go to art school, or that real creative person that comes up with stuff like or origami, and you're like, I don't know how they came up with that. That mind is critical to businesses today, and they're literally in the IT department, never taking, never even touching code, never touching a computer very much typically. So that's the ideation phase. They're, they're really coming up with the innovation, the, the thoughts and the idea. The second ring, the second ring really represents the, well, the program office. Basically that second ring, okay, this group just came out of this room and they've got all these ideas. They looked at Amazon and said, we think we can get it to one click. If we can make this easier, if people only have to touch the computer a couple times, they don't have to re-enter their credit card information every time. They don't have to pick their shipping every time. They don't have to put their address in every time. They'll quickly, I'm boarding a flight, I've got 45 seconds till I'm on board. Quick, 45 seconds, I downloaded my book. Well, you gotta wait till 10,000 feet to use it, but that's a whole different rule. So then they've got their book and they're reading it on flight. You didn't lose the sale to the bookstore on the corner. That's what they're trying to do. So this group then comes in and says, okay, you crazy people, you've got this idea. We are now business process people and project managers. We're gonna look at what you wrote and say, how do we take that process, that idea, literally map it out. Again, they're not using, they're not coding. They're mapping out a process that's really long and shrinking it. So that customer has a really simple experience. They're thinking about that customer experience. Mm -hmm. The project managers are coordinating this conversation to make sure everybody stays on track. And then they're mapping out what it's gonna take, timeline, to get the process from this to this. What, how long is this gonna take? Who's it gonna take? Who are we gonna need in the room? What materials are we gonna need? What's the cost of this gonna be? So again, they're not programmers. They're really just the, they call it the program office, the project managers or the business analysts evaluating it to tighten it up. And then you go to the next stage. And the next stage, it's a little more traditional application development, but now application development has a huge piece to it that is the, the user experience, the front piece of it, the prettiness and how it navigates. So then you hand this information to these developers and what they call user experience experts, and then they map it down a level tighter and start to develop what came out of that room with the crazy creative people, what went through the project managers and the business analyst people, now it's in their hands and they're going to code away and turn it into behind the scenes, that system that we all love. And what, one thing that I want to point out, that chief analytics officer, that whole new world of roles that exist, I was on PotteryBarn.com a couple weeks ago buying some plates. So the predictive, they're predicting our behavior by the way they're mapping things out and saying, what else might this customer do? What else might they do? How do we sell them more stuff? How do we get them more engaged in our website? So now I'm on PotteryBarn.com, I got a plate I got a list below it of other things I might like to set my table, like napkin rings and napkins and da 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 da. Because these people that mapped all this out thought about what other things might this person want and how can we then hand it to our application development department and our database team so they can create this experience so that we sell more stuff and we have a great experience for our, the people coming to our site. So from that, I'll hand over to Amanda to kind of step through the next couple of career paths. Thank you. Hey guys. My name is Amanda Adams. I work for a company called Expansion. Expansion is a professional services software development company specializing in what we've coined cross-sourcing, which is the combination of sourcing resources in rural areas like Kearney, Nebraska, and also sourcing resources offshore in Pune, India. So it's basically our answer to the problems that businesses have faced when trying to cut costs by going offshore, but still maintaining that onshore, close to client kind of quality. So I'm going to pick up and I'm going to talk through a few of these additional areas that you see within the IT space. The first one we're going to touch on is business applications. Now, you know, when you think of large-scale enterprises today, like when you think a company like Amazon, you think Amazon.com, right? How much else is happening behind the scenes to support Amazon.com? You know, how many applications exist? How does the company even handle basic things like HR reporting, payroll? All of these applications are also in the IT space. So when we look at a typical enterprise, a typical industry, we're not looking at one public facing application. We're looking at hundreds of public facing applications plus hundreds of internal applications for these large scale enterprises. So now as a business user, you're looking at that. You've got all these applications. 
What do you do with them? How do you get data out of them? How do these pieces all tie together? So has anyone heard the term big data? Have you guys heard that before? Some nods? OK. So as you can imagine, as you're dealing with all of these applications, you want to start knowing something about how your business works. You want to know specific traits that your customers have. You want to know what your customers browse for before they buy. You want to know that Sue Smith buys 20 books on subject A at certain periods of the month, right? Because you want to be able to offer her ads and you want to be able to get her to buy more books and you want to take advantage of that. Well, how do you know that in this space where there are hundreds of these applications that all have different pieces of the data? This is where you start to get into business intelligence. And that's kind of the art of pulling this all together, pulling the data into one place, and then pulling reports, dashboards, KPIs, getting metrics, farming what those users are actually doing out of those applications. So you know, have, has anybody surfed Google and noticed, like, if you're on a site about, say, agriculture, suddenly they're showing you ads for, oh, I don't know, diapers? Has anybody seen stuff like that? And you're sitting there going, why are they showing me this? That's because somewhere behind the scenes, they've identified that that might be a product that you're interested in based on other sites that you've visited. And that's that big data kind of concept. Does that make sense, guys? Excellent. And the next piece of this, we'll talk about data management a little bit. So I started to touch on this kind of briefly. You know, as you can imagine, you've got hundreds of applications with all this data. Well, now, if I want to know something, I've got to get that data into one place. As you can imagine, the processes for normalizing that data, merging it together, dealing with that data, we're not talking about hundreds of records. We're talking about millions upon billions of records and large-scale data. You know, we're not over terabytes, petabytes. You know, so you're starting to get into just such a large size of data that even handling processing that data is very difficult. And this is a very, I would say, probably in the last five years, this is an emerging space. So there are many job needs here, and this is a new space. So it's kind of getting in on the ground floor. You know, you're not just web designing, designing like folks have, already, have always done. This is a chance where folks can actually come in and kind of determine what processes the organization and even the industry is going to take. So very fascinating kind of stuff. And the next piece, of course, security. And here, you know, this is, this is where it gets interesting. How much of your personal data do you think is actually out there? You know, just the Target has actually, basically Target has published that they know, they track what their customers buy. If you buy something on a credit card every time, they know what you buy, they'll show you ads on your phone, they'll show you ads when they're surfing. They're able to tie that all together to display those ads to you. You know, so have you ever noticed like you'll get flyers in the mail for certain times? Those flyers are actually customized to meet what you might buy. And if you think about that, you know, when you look at that, how much is going on behind the scenes to make that happen? Yeah, you know, it's kind of crazy, right? You know, you're dealing with multiple applications, multiple vendors, multiple different technologies, all to get a hold of that data. And now obviously that data is very valuable. And that's something that folks would want to take from you, that folks would want to steal. So there's a whole new area around securing that data and protecting companies' property, basically. So you know, we're getting to a point now where it's not money that we're protecting. You know, it's not silver in a bank somewhere. It's actually the data, and even really the data around the money that you have. So when you get into that, you know, it, there's a huge level of career there that obviously we're looking for more and more folks to fill. Does this make sense, guys? I'll turn it over to Greg. Thank you. Uh, my name is Greg Nichols. Uh, I'm Chief Technology Officer at ProxyBit in Omaha. Uh, our company is the uh, um, safest marketplace to buy and sell highly valued items. Uh, we spend a lot of time in risk and try to and build a marketplace that, uh, that is safe um, and um, try to sell high, sell high value items. Uh, we are interested in expanding our roles as far as how we impact uh, the, an individual student's career path and their awareness on different things. For the next step of this, we have systems architecture. People can derive and be innovative and be creative. They can start building things, but sooner or later, it has to be able to be exposed to the public or exposed to your customer base. That's where the system architecture comes in. It has to run on computers. 
You've got to have your data park someplace. You've got to be able to network all these components together so they can communicate effectively. Uh, in certain businesses, uh, reliability and stability is key where there may be some level of um, uh, redundancy. Proxy bid uh, systems today run at 99.98% availability. So that's not an easy task. It just doesn't happen on its own. Things break. You need to have things that, that will uh, uh, pick up if a component fails. So these are some things that, that uh, uh, system administrators and other people in the state will actually design computer networks using individual servers or database or networking capabilities that will actually facilitate that type of environment. So it's, uh, it's, it's, it's an environment that uh, is, is technical. You don't code, you don't sit in a dark room and create stuff, but you're trying to facilitate an environment where all the creativity that's been built beforehand is now can be exposed out to your customer base and exposed out to the public so people can make money, like in the Amazon experience. We had a little situation here in, uh, within our company here last summer. It was the Lambrecht Auto Auction in Pierce, Nebraska. And you guys, like, I mentioned it because I figured a lot of people might have probably heard about that. It was an enormous challenge for us because we had a situation where uh, an auction company partner of ours came to us and says, I've got this, uh, I got this auction I need to do. It has 450, 500 automobiles, uh, 50 of which are basically brand new, but they're in the late 50s and 60s, 70s vintage automobiles. Uh, it's gonna draw a lot of attention. So we kind of jumped on this opportunity. We started getting worldwide press. We had press on the nightly news, a lot of different publications. And, um, and we said, great, this is really great. So how do we know our infrastructure and our computer systems are gonna hold up to the traffic that we have no idea about? Not to mention that this auction is gonna take place in Pierce, Nebraska in the middle of a soybean field. Right, so, so we, our challenge was to have to establish an environment where we could provide an enterprise caliber uh, event from a soybean field. This is where these guys came in and said, number one, let's, let's guess and assess what we think we'll do. So we tripled our server capacity, our networking capacity, and we did that with a partner, um, uh, Rackspace out of Dallas, Texas, and uh, they facilitated a lot of that, but uh, we did that within 30 days. We also went off and said, we need to put together a, a, a local network, a wireless network within a soybean field that would cover five acres. We had to engage the local facilities from an infrastructure perspective so we can get communications out of that area, right? We, we want to stream audio and video for this event. So we had to have the right level of capacity and bandwidth to be able to support that. Don't do that typically in Pierce, Nebraska. So that was going to be a problem. So we had to facilitate all these things, and they all did this within uh, this system architecture type of group and these people that did this. So uh, long story short, the product, the, the, we, did, we were successful. The event went off without a hitch. Well, there was a few hitches, but nothing that was catastrophic. So to give you an example how this type of role can impact a company and give the opportunity to the company to be able to, to accomplish things that they normally wouldn't is an area that's... Uh, that's, that's quite interesting. Application configuration, as these guys know, is my favorite because I looked at the slide and said, I don't know what this is. <laughs> <laughs> so, but anyway, but anyway, I do know what some of these things are, I guess, but I've never really had a, a term, uh, you know, really called this thing. But, but basically, uh, when you build applications, you build software, there's, uh, you have users that you need to be able to show how to use the software. There's people that, that you have to configure it in a way that that uh, will work for them. Uh, so these are areas that tend to be more application experts, right? An example, um, Microsoft Excel. I use Excel all the time. I'm a novice, I'm a basic user, but it's very, very powerful. And I could probably use a lot more of it if I knew how to do it, but I was, I'm not gonna take the time to go off and figure it all out. But if I had an application expert in the area of Excel, I could tap that person and uh, learn more from them and they could help me set something up and do something with Microsoft Excel that I couldn't normally figure out myself or wouldn't have the patience to figure out myself. So that's kind of the, the general sense of what this type of thing does. There's also new tools that have entered the market over the last five years as it relates to websites, right? And it, it wasn't that long ago that if you wanted to build a website, you had to be a programmer to figure out how to do it. And they'd build it and it would be created and it would, you know, life would go on. Today there are tools out there where people who don't have computer science backgrounds, people that do not know how to code, they don't know 
a server from a Volvo, right? It, it, they can get in there and they could build websites, they could build this thing, which making uh, individual companies, small or large, uh, uh, exposed to the internet uh, like never before. So these types of people uh, can now do this with, with very little uh, technical education, if you will. And uh, these are the underlying tool sets are being built by developers and coders and engineers. But the, the, the power it puts into the individual's hands is getting uh, greater and greater. Uh, the last area is technical support. Um, you look at a lot of the developers that build this sub. They know, they know the answer. They're experts in it. But, you, but as a company, you're paying these people a lot of money to create and to innovate and build your next wave of, of, of innovation for the marketplace. You don't want to tie them down by answering, a lot of times, the relatively simple questions or, or maybe moderately hard questions. You've, the, the industry has dedicated people become technical experts. Um, within the school district, you probably have someone that says, my PC's broken, who do I call, right? <laughs> it's that type of role, right? You, you become an expert in, uh, in PCs, and, and if something isn't working right or you pick up uh, some malware or something, you've got to have someone come fix that for you and take care of it. These are the technical expertise that I'm talking about. It could get much broader than PCs. It could be different, different software packages you use within your infrastructure. It could be your own software package that you built from a proprietary perspective. It could be a wide range of things. But people, again, can learn these things and learn these disciplines to be able to support internal clients or external clients. So those are those kind of rules that, and roles that, that um, are wide. So uh, there. I have people tell me that, oh, I, uh, I was told to don't go into IT because there's going to be no jobs. Uh, I've heard that. And I've heard that from a number of different sources, and I don't know where it comes from because it couldn't be further from the truth. I heard that before I went to school. That was more than a few years ago. But, but uh, it's been, other than uh, slow economic times, which hurts all industries, uh, there's rarely been a time that there has been sufficient resources available to be able to accomplish the things that the company wanted to accomplish. So there, there is tremendous opportunity. And if you think about the changes in your life that technology have helped facilitate. I mean, I've watched the, the business of movie rentals form, grow, morph, and now dying in my lifetime, right? Um, the way you book travel you used to go to a travel agent. You do it online now. You used to have to go to a stockbroker if you wanted to buy stock. Now you do it yourself online. Right? There's just, there are things that are changing our lives forever. The music industry is another prime example. It's been disrupted by technology and the internet. Cloud storage and cloud capabilities. We'll have our own computer. There was a point in time that wasn't that long ago, if I want to start a business, I had to go buy computers and buy hardware and buy all this stuff. I can go to HostGator this afternoon and I could spend $10 a month for servers and data storage and everything I wanted to form my business. It's creating an environment where innovation is exploding across it. You don't need to have capital to start business. You can do it in your garage. The future is going to be the same, in my opinion. Hardware is getting better, faster, and cheaper. Wireless communication is getting better, faster and cheaper. It's just going to continue to evolve the environment to be more innovative and creative. Businesses are starting to digitize more and more. There's a next revolution people talk about is just the continued digitization of businesses and their, their offerings over the internet. There are things like Google Glass that have formed that are interesting. There's wearable devices. There's this internet of things that are forming today where uh, between uh, microchips and self-sustaining chips and, and they're going to start seeing these things in your homes and on everyday devices. Those are going to start changing the world. You're seeing robotics doing amazing things. So there are also just the acceleration of growth of data and how much information is being collected. That has to be used that will be used by someone. It'll be a whole new set of disciplines that are gonna form out of that that will help businesses and individuals at some point um, manage their day-to-day -day lives. So at any rate, um, I'm, I'm droning on. But at any rate, um, it's, a, it's an excellent opportunity um, for, for kids who have the right type of mindset 
kids that are, are smart, that are analytical thinkers, problem solvers, I want to really encourage them to at least be able to open the door a little bit into information technology. It's a great career, the money's good, and there's a lot of exciting things that are going on in that space. So, Jacob? And so we do have some resources that are listed here. Uh, there's a page in the very back that has all this stuff, but um, basically what it is, so learnstreet.com, it's basically a little training ground that you can do on your own. It has curriculum that you can create for students. Uh, it's free. Uh, Code.org, that was where the video was from. There's a whole bunch more videos, uh, a lot more stats on current state of computer science in the schools across America. Um, the Scratch MIT, that's very similar to Learn Street, but it's through the MIT, um, very prestigious school, so that's also highly encouraged to be used. Um, and then the very last one is actually coursework from MIT itself. So they have the courses, the syllabus, um, PowerPoint presentations, some quizzes on there. You can go in there, see it yourself, and essentially learn from the, some of the smartest professors in America, um, teach your students, or just learn things on your own. Um, and then there's also a computer, Nebraska com Nebraska Computer Science Teachers Association. There's a website there that has a lot of the computer science teachers in Nebraska that are members of that organization. And then the very last link there is statistics on the different professions that these folks talked about, um, average salaries, future openings, things like that, just projections in the future. But it's a lot of stuff that you can definitely use um, to get better insight as far as positions they talked about, salaries, where, there, where there's openings and things like that. And with that, we'll open it up for some Q&A. And I know Rich told me that you have to ask at least three questions before you can go to lunch, so <laughs> make, make them count. <laughs> we met in the hallway. So great question. And I think part of the challenge with a brief session like this is the takeaways are more thought-provoking than actual put it in the classroom. So I think what we wanted to do is get you th your thoughts going so that you want to implement something in the classroom. We would never be so bold as to think we have any expertise in education, mm -hmm. curriculum, students, and any of that. We're more the business side. But what we'd love, the, the kind of two takeaways that we'd love to see go back with you guys to your school systems are just telling students there's more in this career path than expected. Telling parents there's more in this industry and career path than expected. So just, I know I'm not giving you a class to teach where to implement it, we'd love to talk about some of that, and we don't want to be so bold as to cross the line of business and education because you guys are the experts in running the schools. But if you can get the kids to just start to be aware that it's a broader field, or if you see that creative student, push them that way. If you see the analytical student, you push them that way. I think if we can get more people just even starting to look at the camps online and encourage your students to go to them, look at the things that it, we did a code.org at UNO, I'm on the board for Peter Cuban Institute, and we did a code.org for women in IT, we had 72 applicants through just Facebook postings to want to attend a three-day code.org. So if you can look at some of the resources, Jacob has these resources and more, and try to encourage your students to participate and start to encourage the parents to be open-minded to some of the careers that exist. I think there's a, a knowledge awareness gap there that right now, that's the stage we're at. We'd love to say here, we'd love to solve the problem. It'd be presumptuous. We really don't know what you're doing today to say what else could be added. But I believe those conversations will continue. One thing I would throw in, you know, I'd encourage you to leverage the business communities in your area. Mm -hmm. You know, we would love to have students come in and tour our company, and I know I'm not alone. Mm -hmm. You know, we'd also be happy to come to classrooms, present on any topics within the IT space. Mm -hmm. And again, I know we're not alone, you know. So I know this is a new space. I know, you know, in a lot of cases, there may not be a lot of curriculum established, and you're, you know, you're working through that process you know, we'd love to help with that in any way that we can. So, you know, it, I think that's the big thing that I would encourage folks to do is just reach out. So really the answer to that question is absolutely. You know, there are a lot of IT opportunities for folks in rural areas. Really the model that we have, the cross-sourcing model that we've established for IT sourcing is based on being able to find good quality folks in rural areas. At, at potentially better prices than what we would find in larger, more urban areas. You know, when we look at sourcing in your Atlanta, Georgias of the world, large-scale kind of areas, it's very competitive, very expensive, very hard to retain good people. We look at sourcing in community of 1,200 folks. You know, there might be 50 people there who are really strong and would do a great job in IT. There's not tons of competition, which means we can get the best and the brightest. We can get them in. We can get those folks motivated and involved. And in terms of working remotely, that's becoming more and more common and more and more possible. You know, technology exists today to allow you to video with 
as many people as you want. Google Hangout sessions, I don't know if you guys have seen this, but you can basically fire up a Hangout meeting and have folks in 20 different locations in a meeting. We leverage this pretty heavily within our organization. And we do have folks working completely remotely tied to our offices. So, you know, I actually, I came from a rural area. I grew up in Miller, Nebraska. So, <laughs> 30 miles from here. It, you know, so, you know, I really do understand that. And I understand the kids who haven't been introduced to tech in school. But I really would encourage kids to come into this space because there are a lot of opportunities and really a lot of money to be made that they're not going to find, you know, just staying with traditional jobs within their area. I live in the city and I like the city. <laughs> but, I, but, but I would add that um, um, a lot of the cities are, are, are uh, trying to hire more and more people. And there are just, as, as Sue said, there's, I don't know, 1,700 jobs that will go unfilled this year. Right? So um, I have jobs that are open. I'm trying to fill them. It's hard. Um, one of the things that uh, I've chartered myself to do is figure out how to solve that. If I can't solve it in Omaha, Nebraska, how am I going to solve it? I could take a rule approach. I could say, I want to hire people that want to work where they want to live, which I believe is going to be a wave of the future as it relates to um, um, how people are, are hired. Good people who are capable of working are capable of working anywhere they want to work. And, and I think that's going to be a trend that's going to uh, continue to take on. I think a lot of corporations still have the, I kind of want them right here mentality. But I think those, uh, that's going to change over time because uh, the technology does exist. There are ways of being able to make that as close as possible and you can collaborate and build and innovate whether you're in Knox County or Douglas County or, you know, my favorite sitting on a beach in Mexico, right? You, you could, you could, you'll be able to figure that out and that I think that'll be the wave of the future because the good resources are going to want to work where they want to live. And um, that may not be where the jobs are specifically. I would just throw in there, there was an article yesterday in the Lincoln Journal Star about a 19-year-old kid, actually, who runs his own business in Auburn, Nebraska. Um, yeah. His business is called BCom, I believe. But he's, he's actually in college right now, going to Duke University, goes to school during the week, flies back on the weekend, and runs his business in Auburn, Nebraska, however big that is. Um, but you should definitely check that out. It was in the business section. I mean, for me, my personal story was I was, uh, went to high school in Bellevue, Nebraska. Graduated and um, said, I'm pretty certain my dad's not going to let me just hang out around here, and, and so I'm going to do something. So my father was in a sense of in, uh, information technology. He was a project manager in uh, government contracting. So it was pretty simple for me um, because I said, well, if my dad could do it, I could probably do it too. So I went to Iowa Western Community College for two years, learned how to program COBOL uh, on mainframes. and. Um, and uh, that's how I got started. And within five years, I was managing small teams. And through my career, I've been uh, vice president of product development for applied communications or ACI worldwide on a global scale, uh, currently chief technology officer. And so I've been a lifelong learner. Uh, I've learned along the way. Um, so uh, that it's, if you're ambitious and you have, have the work ethic, uh, you know, the sky's the limit. You've seen on the video, some of these guys didn't start out by trying to do anything, anything too miraculous. It just kind of, they were doing what they liked to do and, and it worked out really well. I think my path was probably a little convoluted to technology. I actually, like I said before, you know, I grew up in Miller, Nebraska, about 30 miles from here. Went to a school with, you know, an entire high school of less than 100 folks. 13 kids in my graduating class, you know. So really, I had no exposure to IT before college. I was actually exposed to computers through journalism, so I, I really enjoyed that work. I actually went to college going pre-law, majoring in journalism and political science. I got about three years in, took my first programming class. It was just a required elective. I had to take something, and C++ looked interesting. 100-person kind of lecture hall type class, fell in love with it, then kind of changed my major, got two degrees instead of one degree, and ended up in IT. <laughs> so I'm the one that doesn't look like the others here. I have no background in IT. I actually graduated from the University of Nebraska with a communications degree. 
My first job that I got out of college was selling software. I really got into how it's a problem solving. I'm not, I was never very good in math. I was never that analytical sol solving it to the very end. I was the big picture idea, what if, let's go, everybody like each other. And so I ended up in sales selling software and really got into the problem solving part of technology. Long story short, 1999 bought BizPlan for Dummies right before my 30th birthday. Tried to raise some money, didn't have any luck, but eventually started this business. And 15 years ago, we have about 200 employees. And I do lead the, we have a professional services business, we have a mobile division, and we have an IT consulting division. And we just launched a new division about three weeks ago. And so my background, really how I got into it, was more that problem solving, business minded, look at the different things we can do, look at how we can put teams together and we can introduce solutions to different industries. We do a lot in banking, we do a lot in healthcare. Nationally, we do a lot of mobile solutions for both of those industries. And I come at it from more the business perspective, but our, our company is 100% technology. So a little different path. I think, you know, I'll throw in a comment. I think that's a really key point. You know, when we all think tech, we think that IT techie kind of geek. But as, as you can imagine, if you're working with a team of IT techie kind of geeks who don't have great people skills, You've got to have that person, person, who's interested in tech, understands the big picture, and can pull them all together. I think a lot of times those kids, the guys who would go, oh no, I would never want to do that coding stuff all day, are the ones that we need to pull more into the field because there are so many high-level roles out there for them. Thanks for digging me out. That's cool. <laughs> Thanks, great. Thanks, guys.